Remember, the Great Depression was a result of government policy. First, Hoover. Hoover was very much like George Bush. Hoover refused to allow the market to function. We had a bubble in the 1920s. That was the result of easy money policies, interest rates being too low during that time period. When the bubble burst, instead of allowing the natural correction of the market, which we had always done up until that point, Hoover was interventionist. He was, he was very much anti-free market, anti-capitalism, which is not you know, the spin that's there today. Right. And so he tried everything under the sun. He had his own versions of bailouts and stimuluses. He didn't let the market work. He helped create the depression. Then Roosevelt came in, initially critical of all the things that Hoover had done. But then when Roosevelt came to power, he did the same thing, only worse. Ten times more, He right. came up with a new deal, and now the Depression lasted for a whole decade. The worst part of the economy wasn't during Hoover's term, but in the Roosevelt term. And, and now you have the same situation where you have a Bush, who's the Hoover, who's helping to turn this downturn into a Depression. And now you have Barack Obama coming in, promising more government, more of the stuff that Roosevelt did, and they could turn this into another Great Depression. The difference is the economy is in much worse shape going into this downturn than it was in the 1930s. And with, without a gold standard, without the discipline of gold, uh, we have a, a central bank that could create massive inflation. And so, as I said, we're going to get an inflationary depression, which is much worse than the 1930s, because at least during the 1930s, consumer prices fell. And that made it easier on people who were unemployed or who lost money. Right, because nickel went a long way in the Great Depression, yeah. as my grandfather would always say. But know? what's going to happen now is during this depression, prices are going to be spiraling out of control. Interesting. So on that happy note, we'll leave it there. We'll talk about what it means for investors, Peter. Thanks very much. Sure. Uh, first guy on hold is uh, Mike in Florida. Hey, Mike, are you there? Oh, hi, Peter. Um, hi. I just want to say uh, I read your books, and I, I graduated actually from, uh, just recently from college and uh, with an economic degree. I'm actually going to medicine. I want to say that I've learned more from your books about economics than I ever did in school. But um, I also want to say that I've seen you on TV many times. And you always like saying uh, what you just, you know, gone on saying, why not let these companies go bankrupt? And a lot of people are very, you know, they're very scared about that. But maybe what, maybe what people need sometimes is an actual real example of this actually happening. I wonder if you ever heard of the, uh, the uh, depression of the 1920s when actually the Federal Reserve at that time raised interest rates right that smack in the middle of the depression. It was, unemployment was up about 11.7%. And they raised uh, interest rates. The companies that were, you know, fundamentally sound were able to invest in the future, while the ones that weren't went into liquidation. And within two years, unemployment was actually reversed. Down. I mean, yeah, I mean that happened at the, in, or at the beginning of the 1920s. And again, we had a, a bubble, you know, in, in during in, around the First World War because the, the government created the First World War with inflation, just the way the government paid for the Civil War with inflation. It's like every any time the government came into the economy and created money to finance a war. It was the extra money that always led to a boom somewhere, and then there was always a bust. But what happened was every time we had a bust, whether it was the 1870s or you know, 1920, every time there was a, bu there was a bust, it was short-lived because the government stayed out. The government allowed the free market to work. The first time they strayed from that, the first time they really tried to stimulate the economy and bail people out was the 1930s. And that's why we had the Great Depression. And it's amazing that our leaders are so completely clueless about American history. And it is very dangerous because they think that the, the best thing to do is what we did during the 1930s. And they can't see that that was the Great Depression. And it was the Great Depression for a reason. The reason we didn't have Great Depressions before the 1930s is because the government stayed out. And, and now, the situation now is much more dire than it was in the 30s because we're starting this depression in worse fundamental shape, and our leaders have more tools to do even greater damage. I mean, that's what's crazy. If they were able to create the Great Depression in the 1930s when we had a much sounder economy beneath the surface, imagine how much damage they're going to do with our economy we have today. I, I, gold waking up for it, from its slumber on Friday after being down about 30% from its summer high. Gold, a uh, big up move on Friday. Joined now by Peter Schiff, president of Euro Pacific Capital. And uh, Peter, you're a, a long time and long term bull on gold. Do you think we're seeing gold now reemerge from you know, a, 
a bit of a slump, I would fair to say. Yeah, look, I think gold is going to go a lot higher. I mean, today's move is pretty big, but I think we're going to have much bigger moves to come. I think we're going to have days where gold is up over $100 in a single day. Uh, the, what's going on is central banks around the world, particularly our central bank, they're creating massive amounts of inflation to try to combat the deflationary uh, contraction underway. And by doing that, they're going to wipe out the value of money. Everybody is bringing interest rates down to nothing. And there's no reason to hold these currencies when you can hold gold. Gold is in short supply. It is not being created. But, you know, I think beneath the surface, I've noticed in the past several months that even though gold has gone down in terms of dollars, it's actually been making record highs in terms of the Aussie dollar, the Canadian dollar, the South African rand. If you look at what gold's done versus other commodities like agriculture, like industrial metals, it's like sort of oil, better than oil yeah. gold has held up better than every asset class. If you look at gold relative stocks, when, you know, the year started, the Dow was worth 15 ounces of gold. Now it's not even worth 10. That, so gold is really holding up, but ultimately when this phony dollar rally ends and the dollar really starts to come under some intense selling pressure, gold is just going to go ballistic. Well, I, I, I do agree with you philosophically and even just from an economics perspective. You know, the Fed's printing money like crazy. You, you increase the supply of something, its value is going to go down. But why do you think we've had this six-month or so period where the dollar has rallied, there are deflationary pressures, treasuries yeah. rallying, going through the roof, treasury yields have, have collapsed here? Yeah, I mean, my explanation, of course, I didn't predict this. I mean, I was expecting the dollar would keep right, fall, right, falling. But in hindsight, you can see what's going on. And I think what's happened is American financial institutions are in such terrible shape. There's such a call for liquidity uh, that you're having this massive deleveraging process where U.S. financial institutions and, and, and investors are liquidating everything they have to raise cash, to pay off their debts, to redeem redemptions. It's like a giant margin call on the United States, and we're meeting it with whatever we have, including foreign currencies, foreign stocks, gold. And so that's temporarily suppressing these prices. So it's like, yeah, the gold something liquid. I could sell yeah, it to meet the redemptions that I'm getting. But in the like meantime, that. the world is getting a great deal on all the stuff we're unloading at fire sale prices. And when we're finished doing that, I think these foreign assets, foreign currencies, precious metals are going to take off. And I think the smart money is taking advantage of a lot of strapped Americans and institutions here that are being forced to really get rid of their great investments for next to nothing. So, so how are you positioned here, and, and what is your recommendation for the retail investor? Should they be buying the GLD? Should they be yeah, buying Well, they gold should coin? be taking the other side of this trade. They should be loading up on the quality assets around the world that are being liquidated uh, to fund all these margin calls and redemptions. And understand that you know, you're looking at stocks around the world trading at two and three and four times earnings, offering 20 and 30 percent dividend yields. This is not real. This is never going to exist again. This is an opportunity of a lifetime. And even if you're sitting on U.S. stocks, that are down 30 or 40 or 50 percent and you think it's too late to sell, it's not. You've got a great opportunity to sell these U.S. stocks that are still overpriced and going lower and take advantage of this temporary fire sale going on outside the United so, right, States. So the S&P is trading now at about 10 times trailing 12-month earnings, which yes. is, is not historically the cheapest it's ever been, but it's, but it's really low. I'm looking at future earnings, which are going to all evaporate, <laughs> because the problem is you know, a lot of these companies were selling products to Americans who are now too broke to afford them. Uh, so I think their earnings are going to disappear, especially for the companies that focus on the domestic economy, like the financial services, like the home builders, like the retailers. A lot of these companies are going to suffer. But more than that, a lot of U.S. companies have a lot of debt. And I think ultimately interest rates are going to rise rather sharply uh, for corporations as a result of what the Fed is doing, and you have higher interest payments, you have less revenue, and another thing is pensions. A lot of big companies with this huge decline in the market, right. their pensions are way underfunded. They're lobbying so, Congress to get, allow right. them to stop putting into but the But whatever the earnings they have, yes. they're going to go to the pensions. Right. They're going to go to their interest payments. They're not going to have anything left over for dividends. So this is a big bear market in the U.S. that's going on for another five or ten years, but there is an opportunity to take advantage of the bull markets that are really going on out, outside the United States. There's been a re huge correction, but I think this is a correction in, in a bull market, uh, not a bear market like we're having here. Can you give me specific either names or, or countries where you think the greatest well, opportunities I think, are? I think the best opportunities now are in the Asian countries. Look at Singapore, look at Hong Kong. I mean, these stocks are trading at valuations that were lower than the depths of the Asian economic crisis in 1997. I think that commodity countries like Australia, I mean, commodity prices have been sold down. Uh, they're not going to stay down. This is a great opportunity. Uh, some of these stocks are trading uh, at lower prices than they were 10 years ago, before the whole commodity bull market began. So they're great opportunities. In fact, 
fact, I address these opportunities in, in a book that I have out now called The Little Book of Bull Moves and Bear Markets, where I'm telling people what they can do uh, to survive this bear market and how they can prosper by pursuing alternative strategies. All right, Peter, thanks very much. Thank you. Steve in New York. Hey, Peter. Hi, Steve. Um, I, I'm good, thanks. Uh, I had a question for you. Given how dire your predictions are for the American economy and what the obvious social implications of that are, how do you, how can you even want to remain in this country with your family, uh, given the risks of, you know, what the government might do in terms of well, I mean, first of your all, assets? I mean, I'm divorced and I have one kid, and so it's not even up to me. You know, my my ex-wife and my son could remain in the country even if I left. And I'm not likely to leave the country with a six-year-old son. Uh, how often would I see him? I have other family members. I mean, a lot of my family members are not in my immediate family, and there are other friends I have here. And even if I decide to leave the country, you know, who's going to leave with me? So there are a lot of decisions about about whether or not you stay in the country or whether or not you leave the country. Uh, I have a business here. Um, you know, it's certainly easier for me to run it from the country than 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 outside the country. Um, but 